Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Jeff Welpley. I'm the chief architect at Get Human. I'm here today to talk about isomorphic JavaScript and why I think many of you in this room will soon be using it to build awesome Angular apps that are faster, more powerful, and uh, easier to maintain. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Get Human has a set of online tools that help you with one of the most annoying issues out there today, dealing with customer service at big companies. If you're like me, you've had a lot of bad customer service experience, and we try to help that suck a little bit less. And most people that find Get Human do so through search engines. They will uh, search for some term in customer service or phone number. So if you have, a, for example, a problem with your Facebook account, you might Google Facebook customer service, in which case Get Human is the number one and number two links that show up in the search results, ahead of even Facebook themselves. So why is that? It's, it's not any trick or anything like that. It really comes down to that over time, Get Human has gotten really good at providing very good customer service information to the right people at the right time. And people show through clicking on links that uh, they prefer you know, our sites through some of the competitors. And when I joined Get Human, it was just about you know, this, just about kind of giving information, helping people get uh, to companies faster. But we've wanted to build a lot of new tools since then to help people out even more. And a lot of the new stuff that we wanted to build required building a rich client-side web app, whereas right now, Get Human is just a server-side rendered website. So how do you best combine the two? And now some people may be thinking if I'm talking about combining server-side website with a client-side web app, isn't server rendering dead? Why bother with server rendering at all? You could just build the client-side app and be done. And there are some reasons for that. I mean, uh, Google announced last year that they are indexing client-side rendered HTML. So you can technically get indexed even though if you have just a client-side web app. But the problem is that client-side web apps are still slow for initial page rendering. Uh, just even simpler Angular apps can take four seconds or more. And I know some of the more complex apps that I've built can take six seconds, seven seconds more to, for the initial page load. And that's a problem, not for all apps, but for apps that are consumer-facing where you have users coming in from either links or search results or ads. Now, just to be clear, if you have, if your app is internal only, or like you're building a World of Warcraft in Angular or something like that, uh, I mean, just having a initial page load that's longer doesn't really matter. But for uh, consumer-facing apps like ours, it does matter. So we set a kind of internal goal for um, performance which is 250 milliseconds time to first byte and one second document complete. That means that we want our client browsers to receive an initial response from the server in under 250 milliseconds and then the user to actually see something on the page in under one second. Now that is extremely difficult to achieve on a large uh, website or web app, but it's infinitely easier, easier with server-side rendering than client-side rendering. It's not impossible with client-side rendering, but it's very difficult to achieve consistently. So how do we do that? We can cheat, first of all, which means that we duplicate all of our code. We can keep our server-side rendered website and just literally create a new client-side web app on top of it and just duplicate all of our code. You have a template here, you have them in both places. You have, you know, data validation, whatever. It's just you put it in both places. And this is actually what I did for our first prototype. And it works. I mean, you get exactly what you wanted as far as kind of that initial render and then the client taking over. But who wants to maintain two sets of code, especially in a larger app as it grows? It's just a pain. And it isn't just view rendering. It's a lot of other stuff. Security, data validation, model definitions, routing, utilities. We all have duplicated code throughout all of our stack. And I know pretty much everybody in this room has the same thing, especially if you're, even if you're using, uh, you know, we use JavaScript for our entire stack, but especially if you're using, you know, different technologies on the back end and the front end, you're gonna have the same, you know, regex validation that's in both places. And when you have to update it, you've gotta update it in both places. 
And we didn't want to do that. What we realized is that when we start, well, we started off thinking of just server rendering. Eventually, we realized that really what we wanted is just ultra dry code throughout our entire stack. So how do we do that? You know, I, I came uh, when we were building the initial prototype. I came upon a really great article by a guy called Spike Brem from Airbnb, and he talks about this thing called isomorphic JavaScript. And Spike used a library that Airbnb developed called Render to run backbone code on the server. And he talks about the concept of having the same exact piece of JavaScript code being able to run in multiple environments. Having the server do the initial render and then the client picks up seamlessly while the developer just has to write one piece of code. And I love that concept and so I wanted to bring that to Angular, which is what I had written our initial prototype in. So I was all gung-ho. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then my like, soul got crushed once I tried to actually uh, implement it because Angular is tightly coupled to the DOM. It's tightly coupled to working in a browser. And trying to run it on the server is problematic. Everything you do goes through the DOM. So you know, this is uh, kind of trying to depict Angular client rendering where Angular takes a template and it sticks it in the DOM before it evaluates expressions, runs the controller, et cetera. And it's only after all of that that you get the final rendered HTML at the bottom. If on the server I want that final rendered HTML, I still have to go through the DOM. So how do you do that? Well, you could use a headless browser. That's, that's one option that definitely people use. Uh, something like JS DOM or PhantomJS, where you're actually running Angular on the server in the context of this headless browser. And that works, and it's actually great for testing, but at runtime for server rendering, uh, it definitely doesn't work at runtime. It's, it's way too slow and resource intensive. And you can run it off host and kind of generate uh, the pages and kind of cache them and serve them up later. But if you either need low cache times that you need it like um, you can't cache pages for long periods of time or you have many pages, like we have tens of thousands of pages, it just becomes infeasible. Also, uh, this does nothing to help with, with kind of our other thing that we were starting to think about of just sharing code between all layers of our stack, including the API. So this is just kind of a server rendering thing. Second option is to refactor Angular. So I mentioned that Angular is tightly coupled to the DOM, but we could refactor the actual Angular core code, right? And instead of Angular talking to a DOM, we could talk to a virtual DOM. Sort of like what this guy's talking about. But <clears throat> it's not necessarily uh, this. I actually did try to, um, <laughs> I, I did actually try to uh, make these changes in Angular to like actually refactor Angular. And it's just a lot of work. Uh, it, it became something that, again, was kind of infeasible. I mean, you know, I am uh, coming from Boston, especially with like a lot of snow we had. Ev everybody is a little bit crazy, but I'm not that crazy. Uh, well, a little bit crazy, but. So let's think of a, uh, of a third option. And in thinking about that, let's look at some code and try to think about what code do we think is easier to run on both the client and the server. So here's a typical Angular service where we have just an object with two functions. Really simple. So would it be easier to take this code and run it on the server or Something like this. So this is the same object, right? It just doesn't have the wrapping. And that's key, though, because it's the difference between teaching the server side what is Angular, what is a factory, et cetera, or just exposing to the server the actual object. So there is actually today, even outside of some of the other stuff I'm talking about, you could do this, and, and there are people uh, who use Browserify to take kind of a simple object like this and then wrap it for Angular, which I, I would definitely uh, suggest, if, if nothing else, it, it sort of helps you to reuse code at some level. But let's, let's look at a, a more complex example. So in this case, we are using the UI router, and we're defining a state where we have you know, URL, template, et cetera. Now this, it has the wrapping thing like we talked about, but it's also, we have an actual dependency that's a problem, right? Like, what's, what's the state provider on the server side? 
like we do need routing on, on the server side. We have an express router. We have a happy router, whatever you're using on the server side. But the state router is really a UI router specific thing. Let's compare this to something like this, where we actually are just taking the data and defining it in a simple object. Now this, you could still use with the UI router, right? You could just uh, pass a reference to the UI router and kind of dynamically loop through like um, this object and generate the routes. But the cool thing is that you can also use this on the server. You can, whatever server framework you're using, you can loop through this and uh, adapt it to that environment. And so that's what we're talking about here, where we have for this, op this uh, third option, this layer at the top of vanilla JavaScript that isn't dependent on any particular framework. It's not dependent on Angular, not dependent on any server-side framework, just vanilla JavaScript. But then you have a series of adapters that work off that vanilla JavaScript and will generate code for each of the specific environments. For example, here is uh, an example of a data resource. So this is one of our vanilla JavaScript objects that we use at Get Human. And, and I should mention, by the way, that it's not as important the specific values in this object or even which objects I'm using. Uh, it, I'm, the, the thing I'm mostly talking about is the approach of creating these vanilla JavaScript objects and having adapters. So for your own environment, you may have different objects. You may have different values within these objects. But uh, this is an example from some of the stuff that I worked on, where we have a data object that defines the fields, uh, the API for that data, uh, some of the security around that data. So if the happy API adapter, so we use happy, but again, uh, regardless of, of what you're using on the, on the server side, if, if you were using ex Express, you would have an Express adapter. But for us, we use a happy adapter. It takes that data resource file, and it generates API endpoints, security access within the API, and then data validation for all the tra transactions. We could also take that data resource and put it through the uh, Angular adapter and generate the API client stubs, and then Angular custom validators that you can put in your forms. So what about rendering? For rendering, the big, uh, the first important issue to understand is that there's a sort of general trend with web development now that you see in all frameworks sort of everywhere, really, to take a view, take like the entire page for a given uh, whatever the user is looking at, and break it into small reusable pieces, often called components. So they have the web component spec that is kind of the, the future standard. If you look at any of the uh, major frameworks now, React has components, Angular 2 has components. In Angular 1x, there are components. I mean, that's what directives are, right? That you can use them as components. In fact, I would highly suggest um, Matthias Nimala has a course on Angular, on um, AirPair, talking about how to use, effectively use directives as uh, components in your app. And I would highly recommend that. So for our, what well, we're talking about having this vanilla JavaScript player, we also have a component. And this is, again, just for our kind of definition, some, some of the values that we use in that component. But the idea is to take that small piece of a view and everything that's kind of self-contained for that piece, the styles, the view, the, the model, the controller, everything. And you all have it in one place. So a simple example of this is just simple model view controller where we have uh, the model would be reused on both the server and the client side, just in this case, just some simple data foo. The template, which you guys should recognize, is using Angular syntax for the template. And then a controller. And it, most of the time in, in the way that we, we use this, the controller is only used on the client side because it's only used for some of the kind of after the initial render, some of the UI events and that type of thing. So this object can be used by the, the server adapter untouched. It can just use this and, and render this component. On the client side, we have to change things a little bit. So the client side adapter will actually generate this directive. So you, you'll notice some similarities here. I mean, it has the template. The controller is pretty much the same, except we took the model data and stuck it in the controller. And then it has the kind of wrapping for Angular. 
but it's pretty similar. So you could see how it's not just a matter of the kind of browser fi rewrapping, but we're also actually changing it in some cases depending on what we're trying to do. So this option three is all about using shared pieces, about shared vanilla JavaScript that we're breaking apart into separate workflows, like kind of separate generated code for different environments. So we, for rendering, we have the server side that does something slightly different from the client side. So the, the high level picture of the rendering uh, would be something like this, where the initial request would go through the server side, do the, the, the generation of the page that gets sent back to the browser, and then Angular takes over and does uh, its own rendering. Now, the key part in all this is this tree-looking structure on the left-hand side, which it represents the server-side rendering engine. So what is that? Basically, to start off with, when we uh, have a page, we need to translate it into an object, and uh, really an object in a, a tree structure that is sort of similar to the DOM. It is not the DOM. The DOM is very heavyweight, has a lot of stuff associated with it. But we do need to convert like a HTML template into something that we can kind of work with, right? So uh, I, I have a simple library called JIT, J JYT, that I use to do that translation. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And then once we have it in an object, we can do traverse the tree. And for each element, each node on the tree, we do two things. We do a dollar sign parse, which is actually reusing the angular dollar sign parse, um, evaluating expressions like any of your uh, curly brackets within the template, basically. And then a transformation, which is the, the server-side equivalent of what a directive does. Except instead of touching the DOM, I'm just kind of doing an in-place replacement within this tree-like object. And then at the end, it just translates from the object back to HTML, and that's your rendered page for the server. So what are the advantages of using this approach? Number one is that it meets all the requirements. It's you know fast. It, it, runs on the server and then the Angular takes over and it does exactly what we want it to and we can share whatever we want because we're using vanilla uh, JavaScript, this kind of layer above everything else. We have no restrictions in what we can kind of share. It works with Angular 1x, which uh, not a lot of things do. Actually, I, I was interested to see Yuri talk about the uh, Angular Meteor thing. I'm definitely uh, going to look into that because I haven't seen many other options out there besides headless browsers for doing, using Angular and rendering on the server. And then uh, the abstraction above other frameworks, this is something that I didn't realize was going to be as big of a, a benefit when I started. But working at this layer above Angular allows you to add your own customizations, your own conventions on top of not only Angular, but whatever other frameworks you're using. And it, it allows you to create a lot of efficiencies. You're not fighting the framework as much because you can do whatever you want and you just have to kind of retrofit it into whatever target environments you're using. And then a migration path. This is actually another great side benefit that I didn't initially think about. But using this stuff, we actually have a pretty good migration path to 2.0. Because a lot of the vanilla JavaScript we can reuse for 2.0. It doesn't matter all the crazy changes that they're making. And a lot of the work that I am in the process of, of doing right now is essentially creating the 2.0 version of the adapter. So really, it's just all about that sort of translation layer, not as much about the actual components and that type of thing, which will largely remain the same outside of some stuff in the templates. And I, my goal is actually that uh, I'll get to the point where I can kind of have the same vanilla JavaScript objects that can translate to either format, which will be great. But there are disadvantages, and uh, I definitely uh, admit a lot of the disadvantages that. Uh, are with the kind of solution that I have so far, which is number one, it is an unfamiliar format. Even though the vanilla JavaScript layer is simple and I think pretty elegant, the fact is that, is that it's different than what you're working on in the Angular world. The generated code can be quite different in some cases. And for someone, whenever we try to pull on Angular developers to help us out, there's always this learning curve. It's just not ideal. There's always is going to be some differences between that vanilla layer and kind of the target generated layer. But in an ideal world, it wouldn't be as drastic as it is right now. The, customer uh, the custom 
server engine that I built, uh, which I, I kind of went over briefly, works really well, it's fast, but other than the dollar sign parse, which I reused from Angular Core, it's, there's nothing similar to the way that Angular does rendering. And I, I've sort of tried to support the same stuff, but more than likely, if, if like somebody else outside of Get Human started using it, they'd probably run into edge cases where, you know, okay, I didn't support something that Angular Core does or whatever. And that's just not ideal. I'd, I'd prefer if it actually supported the same exact thing that Angular Core has. And then re-rendering, I, I mentioned it very quickly, but for the overall rendering picture this, uh, in our current solution, the server side renders, and then when the client side takes over, it actually re-renders the whole page. Uh, and there's some technical reasons for that that I won't get into today, but the point here is that even though we've, we've um, made the solution to the point that there's no jank, like the user actually doesn't notice, but it's still not ideal. There, there's some uh, various edge cases where it actually does cause a problem like for example, the user will instantly see the page, and if they start typing in a text box, then Angular takes over, it'll actually like, clear it out. And so you have to do things like the server side has to like, disable that before the client takes over. And it, again, it's just not ideal. So let's put on our uh, geek glasses and think about how can we address these deficiencies and make sort of the ideal isomorphic solution with Angular. So for the un unfamiliar format, it would solve a lot of problems if we just moved to ES6. For those of you who don't know, ES6 is the name of the next version of JavaScript. Also, sometimes some people call it ES2015. I don't know many people that call it that, but that, I guess that's the official name. And it has a, a module system in ES6 that everybody is converging to use. So in the future, uh, Node, uh, Angular, they're all going to get rid of their existing module um, formats and use the EX6 format. There won't be CommonJS anymore or AMD or whatever. Well, it probably will exist, but everybody pretty much is, is converging on this. So if we use this, the format would be more similar across the vanilla JavaScript and the generated code. For the custom engine, if we were, I, I mean, I joked about this before that it being too difficult uh, kind of refactoring Angular to create a DOM abstraction, but if there was a DOM abstraction, it would make things a lot easier because the Angular core code could be more portable. I could take more of the actual Angular, Angular core and reuse it on the server. So it'd be great to have those abstractions. And then instead of re-rendering, sort of the ideal is to have, be able to somehow tell Angular, okay, the page has already been re-rendered. Re Don't render it again, just bind. Just, just uh, attach to all the event handlers and kind of you know, skip a digest cycle. Like once, uh, just start making changes from that point forward. Fortunately, the nice thing is that all of this stuff is gonna be implemented in Angular too. So this is why I started off talk talking about how I think that a lot of people in this room are going to be using isomorphic soon. It's because, not that Angular 2 has server rendering, it doesn't. But it will have a lot of pieces that will make isomorphic easier. And I think it's only a matter of time when that bar is lowered, because I, I know personally of the great benefits of being able to share code across all your environments, to do stuff like server pre-rendering, I think it's only a matter of time whether it's I, I do it or I, I know a lot of other people are going to be interested in this as well. Leveraging all this new stuff in Angular 2, kind of building on some of this other stuff that I've worked on and building a really awesome isomorphic solution that everybody can use. I think it's only a matter of time. All right, so let me wrap things up talking about stuff you better do. So number one, use vanilla ES6 even in your existing Angular 1x app, that 1.x app that all of you guys are using today, you can do the approach that I talked about, you know, extracting out vanilla JavaScript objects that you can then share other places, and it's easier to migrate to 2.0. There's a lot of benefits here, and you, if you're gonna do that, you might as well use ES6 because, again, that's what everybody is, is moving towards. Start learning Angular 2. For this talk, I had to kind of dive into a lot of the new stuff coming out with Angular 2, and 
it's just a lot of great stuff that's going to be part of it. You guys are going to hear a lot about it at the conference today or this weekend. So I, I d highly recommend kind of diving into some of the documentation, trying out some of the examples, et cetera. Uh, I wrote a blog post called More Better Unified JavaScript that kind of talks about all this stuff in more detail uh, that you can check out. And follow me on Twitter. Thanks a lot.